Hi, I'm here today with uh, Kaushik Das, who's the head of data science at Pivotal. Uh, welcome, Kaushik. Thanks, Greg. Nice to be here. So, Kaushik, you're a proponent of the idea of the digital brain. Um, you can tell us a little bit about the, the digital brain, how it uh, how it tracks the, the human brain, and under what circumstances we can make use of this uh, this digital brain. Sure, sure. I would I would love to do that. So effectively, you know, uh, just like um, we humans um, have a brain which coordinates the information that comes from the senses and uses that information to decide what action to take, which then is conveyed to the motor system. Today, we are at this uh, sort of unique juncture in history where we human beings have built artificial systems which have the sensory organs which have the motor organs you know, due to the advanced control systems, but what it's lacking is the digital brain. So this is, uh, the field of artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, but this is a particular specific instantiation of AI where we are use, able to use big data to get all, all the sensory information possible and turn the whole system intelligent. So as an example, think of an offshore oil rig, right? There are so many activities going on, different agencies doing different actions. Unless you can take advantage of all of that data and build one mathematical model, you're, not, you're, you're going to miss some of the information which can alert you to dangers. So the digital brain really is uh, something that can help us um, control these systems, make them more efficient, and prevent disasters. So what's the role of the, the human in all this? Do, does the human, if the human is not making the decisions as quickly mm -hmm. as the machines and they have, they're, they're unable to process the same amount of information as the machines, right. uh, where, where does the human fit in the design process? So the human is still, still at the center of the whole system. We are not really, uh, we're nowhere near you know, being able to replace the humans. And frankly speaking, that's not my goal either. My goal is to make the human decision maker more capable. And the way we do that is the brain looks for patterns based on data which has been labeled by humans as to what is desirable and what is not desirable. And, and the brain is able to sense those patterns in real time much faster than the humans. So usually what it does is that it gives a heads up to the human saying, hey, this thing is going well, the drill bit needs to change, or you know, this particular subsystem, you know, maybe the cooling system is not behaving as it should. But in the rare situation where the brain can actually see an imminent disaster, then the brain is capable of taking over and actually shutting down the system. But except in emergencies, the human is still in control. So you've talked about something called the eightfold path of data science. And uh, within that first, within the first four uh, parts, um, tell us about the most difficult part. So actually, um, the most difficult part is the data part. So the first four parts are uh, formulating the problem, uh, getting the data together, then building a model, and finally applying the model. So it's getting the data, understanding the data, and essentially getting the relevant features out of the data that takes the longest time because it needs um, a, a combination of skills, you know, which, are, which you can't find in one person. So you need a team for that. Mm -hmm. You need domain knowledge to understand and interpret the data. You need people who really understand big data technology and math so they can select the right mathematical tools and use those in the right with the right tool set uh, in terms of technology so for instance you know if you're looking at a uh, video data and you're looking for uh, intruders right you think it's a simple problem but depending on the location where the video is from and the, you know, even the cultural customs and um, the customs of people, say if it's in a factory, uh, what is normal and what is anomalous is completely different. And also the sheer scale of the problem is that you're not, you end up with uh, essentially hundreds and thousands of features. So you really need advanced mathematical techniques 
to get the ones that are relevant and reject the ones that are not. So uh, let's talk about a case study. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that say that you need to start with a question and then go find the data. And there are other people that say, well, let's go get some data and then see what kind of questions we can ask uh, of the data. Um, but I think in, in reality, it's kind of a uh, recursive uh, exactly. <laughs> process. Yeah. So tell me the, about the, um, the, the, what you've worked on with um, smart meters. Yes, exactly. So that's a fascinating problem because as you, you're very right, that you need both, right, to actually have a solution. So in the case of smart meters, uh, we have a, a smart meter manufacturer, one of the big ones in the Bay Area called Silver Springs, and they came to us in the early days of, of uh, when Pivotal used to be called Green Plum, actually, and then we were part of EMC, and Silver Springs said, look, we are collecting all this data, and we're using it for billing, but there is a lot more information there. Why can't you use it for something else? And for me, you know, I didn't really have the answer. What can you use it for? So I didn't have the questions. So I could see that the data was there and the data had valuable information. So what we did was that Silver Spring experts and experts from Pivotal, we together went to different utilities and did workshops with them to figure out uh, mm -hmm. what the particular questions are which would be of relevance to them. Mm -hmm. And we actually found there were a lot of good questions, one of them being power theft. So for instance, um, you know the pattern of user behavior across your entire base of users, right? Uh, and then what you can do is use, use the same technique that Amazon uses to cluster their readers or Netflix uses mm -hmm. to cluster their viewers. But now you're clustering the users based on their usage patterns. And then when you see them suddenly behaving differently or you see the outliers in the clusters, mm -hmm. you are able to detect something that has gone wrong and you're even able to tell whether it's because of power theft mm -hmm. or equipment malfunction and then take the right action. And then you may discover that in order to answer that question better, you may need to collect a different set of data. Right, yeah. exactly. Often, you know, it's it's not um, a straight, uh, mm -hmm. you know, arrow-like project. It's it's kind of a cycle yeah. where you discover things and uh, then that leads you to uh, get more data and s redo the process. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you learn a lot about what's going on and you're taking the organization to a different level in terms of data smartness. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you, Kashik, for coming in. Thank you, Greg. It's always a pleasure.